Man is on a quest to build robot warriors. Real terminators that are stronger than people, faster, able to make their own decisions. Your military has already tested prototypes. But how do we get from this to this? The future of robots in my mind is to completely revamp the way we think about battle. They should be able to pick up 200 pound weights hundreds of times and not even be able to notice it. This series investigates how the impossible is becoming possible and what it might mean in the future. At what point do we give the ability to make a kill decision to a machine? Self-replicating robots could lead to the end of the human race. Are you happy with this? Iraq, 2007. With an unrelenting campaign of bombings and hit-and-run attacks, insurgents have plunged the country into chaos and foiled the world's most powerful military. At this dark hour in the war, the U.S. Army launches a top-secret mission to deploy a new type of soldier never before seen in battle. Killer droids, known as Swords Robots. When SWORDS was deployed in 2007, it was a revolutionary attempt to use unmanned ground systems with lethal force. I'm Bob Quinn, Vice President of Military Robotics, Kinetic North America. Sixty percent of casualties to American forces during the first five years of operations in Iraq had to do with first contact with the enemy. The robots can help fix the enemy's location, allowing the soldiers to finish the enemy without being exposed themselves. The SWORDS robot program is named after the Special Weapons Observation Remote Direct Action System. It was commissioned by the U.S. government and Pentagon's high-tech planning division known as DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA's mission, keep U.S. military technology ahead of our enemies. They've been the force behind such previous military advances as the M-16 assault rifle, the stealth fighter jet, and the Internet. DARPA's role is to be visionary, to look at the way things are currently done, and to think outside of their box. Just what is required to perfect real Terminators? That's Impossible has assembled a to-do list. To be combat ready, they would have to mimic the human body. See, walk upstairs, even climb like a person, and be able to think, at least enough to distinguish enemy from friend, and make decisions. Another key, they would be expendable. Swords is DARPA's first step in that bold, somewhat frightening future. It cannot think or climb yet, but it can see in a way. SWORDS has video cameras for eyes, which transmit real-time images of its surroundings to a human operator. It's radio controlled using two joysticks, one for movement, the other for firing weapons. All an operator has to do is pick their target, lock the weapon system in, and shoot. In the classified Iraq operation, the three SWORDS robots were trucked in by an armored vehicle as part of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division. Each robot was armed with an M249 light machine gun. They were positioned in strategic locations outside Baghdad. Taking cover a few hundred yards away, the soldier assigned to operate each robot using a joystick waited for the command to open fire. Reportedly, that's when something went wrong. Recently, a story emerged suggesting that a SWORDS combat robot had swiveled its guns towards friendly troops, uh, prompting it to be withdrawn uh, from Iraq. I'm Nick Pope. I worked for 21 years at the British Ministry of Defence. And there is huge controversy about this. 
There are different stories being bandied around, all sorts of rumors and denials. There were comments that uh, were taken from certain Pentagon spokesmen. Under testing circumstances, uh, these uh, robots actually started to turn their guns on some of the soldiers there. I'm John Rennie, Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. Everybody involved is saying that that is not at all what did happen. Kinetic, the manufacturer of swords, opened its headquarters and provided exclusive access to its latest battle bot called Mars. It's similar to swords and a window into how both work. Mars is more heavily armed than swords. Packing an M240 machine gun, 50 caliber M82 sniper rifle, and a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. A Terminator on treads. Like swords, it's sent into battle by wireless remote control. Lead designer Dan DeGuire has agreed to demonstrate it for the first time on television. It's basically a teleoperated system. We have proportional joysticks. Move the joystick with proportional command and it commands the robot and sends it on its way. Right now facing us is a backup camera and um, you can see it in this corner screen and any, any one of these can be pulled up to full view. We have a drive camera going forward, we have a weapon sighting camera and then we have a pan tilt camera for situational awareness. In all locations we know the signal strength, how well is the communications and uh, we know where it is in Latin long so we have GPS on that robot and it's reporting back its position. On top of it, it has a rotating turret that will rotate 360 degrees, uh, independent of the chassis. The turret rotates at up to 150 degrees per second. It has an elevation capability uh, of minus 20 to plus 60 degrees. This is the very beginning of a revolution in how um, future systems and future wars may be formed. It's one thing to let machines be attacking people when we're controlling them. It's another one to put machines onto a battlefield and let them exercise their own judgment about who they should be shooting at. At first, there's sort of an optimistic hope that, you know, maybe humans don't have to die in conflict. The issue can be resolved but by something mechanical. And I think, you know, as, as time wore on and that fantasy evolved, you saw this vision of first optimism that robots could be something better than people and then turning to pessimism and almost fear that robots could be our, our destruction. Today our robot fantasies are filled with haunting visions of a robot race turning on mankind. But it wasn't always that way. Man's obsession with robots dates back 500 years to the Renaissance and one of the greatest minds to ever live. Leonardo da Vinci had a wonderful apparatus that was mechanically programmable and it was used in uh, demonstrations that would roll out on a stage and turn. So this idea that you could have uh, automatons that you could program, that they would do some task, has been around for a long time. The term robot found its way into popular culture in 1921 in the wake of World War I and its mechanized horrors. There was a play in 1921 called uh, Rousen's Universal Robots by a Czech playwright, uh, Karol Čapek. He coined the phrase robot, uh, which comes from a Czech word for uh, forced labor. It, in a way, was the template for a lot of the uh, robot uprising stories that have uh, occurred since then. In his story, the, uh, uh, the robots eventually actually destroy everybody, uh, the entire human race except for one man. So the tale's pretty bleak. Even with this bleak outlook, man continued on his quest to develop robot warriors. The first to see battle was a suicide robot that could crawl, tethered to the end of a remote control leash. The world's first robotic soldier was the German Goliath, a sort of mini tank developed in the Second World War. An operator uh, controlled it with, through a cable and then aimed it at targets such as pillboxes and buildings and it then carried an explosive charge which was detonated. The Goliath was basically a bomb on treads, four feet long, two feet wide, and one foot tall. It was designed as a single-use weapon. To attack, 130 pounds of explosives were packed inside the robot. 
Then the gasoline engine was turned on, and Goliath was steered remotely toward this target using a joystick control box attached to the robot by a triple-strand telephone cable. The Goliath was effectively a sort of uh, remote-controlled mine. It had a little motor, um, the operator used a cable, uh, the thing was pointed, aimed, and then detonated. The first Goliath saw action in the spring of 1942. And by the time the Second World War ended, more than 7,500 of them rolled off the assembly line. The face of battle had been changed forever. All subsequent uh, robotic devices of this sort have their roots uh, in the Goliath program. Everything since then has effectively evolved from Goliath. Sixty years later, another robot saw battle, and it too was remotely controlled. Only this robot had wings and could fly. Like Goliath, it was expendable, a key to developing real Terminators. It bore the ominous name Predator UAV, Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. About the size of a school bus, the Predator is a very complex remote-controlled plane. It's linked by military satellite to a ground-based command center miles away from the battlefield. From here, a pilot using a joystick and a high-powered video camera maneuvers this half-ton flying robot. The Predator was first put into service back in 1995 in the Balkan conflicts in Bosnia and Kosovo. At that point, it was used purely for reconnaissance, and it would survey the battlefields and give the U.S. military an idea of what was happening there. By 2000, the Air Force was exploring ways to use the UAV in a more aggressive strike role. The Predator really came to prominence in the Afghan war in the hunt for Osama bin Laden. The plan was developed to try to outfit it with new Hellfire missiles. It could launch those from altitude and attack bin Laden without ever being seen. There was a growing concern within the CIA about the threat he posed, dubbed Afghan Eyes. The goal of this secret mission was to use a UAV to find bin Laden and take him out. Dr. Bruce Borup is a retired U.S. Army Airborne Ranger and former battalion air operations officer. He is also one of DARPA's leading developers of robot warriors. In September 2000, the CIA conducted a number of tests with the Predator, using it as a reconnaissance vehicle to try and locate Osama bin Laden. In fact, the first two videos uh, did take pictures of a tall man in uh, white robes surrounded by a guard detail, which analysts later described as probably bin Laden. In October 2000, the test predator crashes. The program will stay grounded for a year. If circumstances were slightly different, the world's most wanted criminal might have been killed by a robot warrior. There were delays in arming the Predator. There was a lot of issues involved. Uh, uh, who controls the Predator as a weapons platform? Uh, what are the rules of engagement? Uh, there were also some issues about whether or not host countries would allow the Predator to fly with, with missiles. The Predator would not fly again until after 9-11. But when it finally returned to the air, the UAV was armed with Hellfire missiles. A first look at robotic warfare of the future. The Predator flying at 10,000 feet is very silent. Uh, the Hellfire is supersonic. You combine those two and there's almost no warning of an attack. This video shows the deadly accuracy of one of these flying robots taking out a battle tank. In a typical attack, a Predator is soaring at an altitude of 5,000 feet, firing at an enemy target one mile away, would annihilate its target in four seconds. This would prove decisive in Iraq, in the troubled enclave of Sadr City in 2008. Sadr City had become a safe haven for Muqtada al sadrs militia. Uh, it was using this location to rain rocket attacks down on the Green Zone, where the U.S. Embassy and the fledgling Iraqi government were located. The military called in the Predator and another UAV, the Shadow. The shadow helped get to reconnaissance and identify the locations where some of the, the militia members were located. 
That information was then fed to the Predator, which then used that to target where it should send its missiles. Death in the blink of an eye, and the Predator is not yet a thinking Terminator. It doesn't make its own decision. But that is coming as the impossible becomes possible in our time. The lethal precision of unmanned aerial vehicles to destroy enemy targets is proof that robots can fight our wars. But military leaders agree that to be victorious, it will take a boots-on-the-ground combat droid that can see, think, and even react like a human. In almost any warfare situation, you'd rather send machines out there to be destroyed rather than flesh-and-blood people. One of the real frontiers for robot development these days is in trying to create humanoid robots, ones that have a, a shape that is a lot more like the human body. If you're sending a robot soldier into some sort of city, uh, it needs to be able to walk through doorways. It needs to be able to climb stairs. It basically needs to have all the kinds of agility that you would associate with a human soldier, but of course, none of the actual flesh and blood vulnerabilities. It's one of the visions being pursued by the Pentagon's dream department, DARPA. And many of DARPA's dreams are coming true. DARPA absolutely has been looking into the uh, feasibility of creating a humanoid uh, robot actually for uh, a long time now. One of the big challenges DARPA's scientists face is how to get the first generation of battle droids out of the air and onto the ground walking on legs. DARPA enlisted the help of a company called Boston Dynamics in building a robot called Big Dog. The motivation behind Big Dog is to get some of the mobility and agility that we see in animals. I'm Mark Rabert, head of the Big Dog Project. Animals with legs can go almost anywhere on Earth, but uh, wheeled vehicles and tracked vehicles are pretty limited. Even newborn uh, mountain goats and uh, newborn almost any kind of quadruped can walk immediately, can climb, can follow their parents as they go up and down very steep inclines on rough terrain. Okay, following in three, two, go. The stable and sure-footed anatomy of four-legged creatures has inspired the amazing design of Big Dog. Big Dog's traveled on a 35-degree slope. It's traveled up a muddy hill and through the mud. It's traveled in snow, uh, both up and down. We've had it carrying over 300 pounds. DARPA envisions the robotic soldier carrying 400 pounds over all types of terrain, four times the capacity of a human soldier. The ability to tote heavier payloads into remote areas will fundamentally change the way ground troops fight guerrilla insurgencies. Suddenly we have the ability to take into battle things we would not have taken before because they were just too heavy. Suddenly we can take large ladders, heavy artillery, heavy weapons that we wouldn't otherwise have taken. Big Dog's powerful muscles are hydraulic actuators which contain sensors to measure joint angles and how hard the actuators are pushing. For balance, the robot has a gyroscope that mimics the sensory receptions in our inner ear. A computer monitors all of the sensors to figure out how to give the robot its footing on rough terrain. When the robot's climbing in the mud, it has abilities to sense that it is slipping on the terrain, and then it adjusts how much load it puts on each leg in order to uh, keep its traction and its balance and its forward motion. The big dog is really sort of cool or slightly creepy sort of robot. I think a lot of people have seen it move and are astonished by it. Perhaps most astonishing are the frenzied autonomous movements the robot makes when it loses its footing. It has some really fascinating capacity to recover from slipping or being struck. And the way it scrambles its legs around, the way it recovers from being knocked almost completely over is spookily biological. The behavior of Big Dog over the last few years has come a long way, but there's no sign that we're really at the limit. As Big Dog's ground capabilities continue to expand, 
DARPA started another project in 2004 to explore the next skill for a real Terminator, the ability to climb. One of the scientists they've tapped to bring this vision to life is Mark Kutkowski. DARPA has a program to try to develop climbing robots for various applications, surveillance, inspection, and so on. I'm Professor Mark Kutkowski at Stanford University, and my goal is to build robots that can go anywhere. One of the advantages of climbing robots is surveillance, uh, spying, or uh, monitoring areas, because they can climb a building or a tree or another structure. The ability that we required was for the ability for a robot to walk up a vertical surface and achieve a position high up in a tree or up a telephone pole up a, up a wall. To achieve this daunting goal, Kutkowski worked closely with biologists to unlock the mysteries of nature's best climbers. We've been collaborating with uh, Professor Robert Fole at UC Berkeley for a number of years. Dr. Fole shot slow-mo videos and microscopic photos of insects to find out how they used tiny spines on their feet to climb vertical walls. Applying Fole's discoveries, Kutkowski set out to develop the feet for a climbing robot named Rise. Here you can see how the spines are grabbing little bumps and pits on the surface, and we have lots of these tiny spines, so they share the load. The real hard problem came down to how do you achieve the attachment forces between the foot and the vertical surface that's great enough to support the weight of the vehicle itself. If you want a robot that climbs vertical surfaces, smooth, rough, dirty, clean, then the gecko really is the premier example of a climbing animal. The gecko can cling to glass by a single toe and walk upside down on the ceiling. It sticks to the surface through a phenomenon called van der Waals forces. Van der Waals forces are a basic molecular attraction that always exists between any two molecules if they get close enough. And it has to do with a kind of momentary um, arrangement of the electrons. And you can take advantage of it if you can get really intimate contact between two different surfaces. Millions of tiny hairs on the gecko's toes create the intimate contact with a climbing surface that generates van der Waals forces. Kutkowski and his team have built a droid called StickyBot that harnesses that same power. It is basically our attempt to um, take the, the principles that we've learned from how geckos climb and apply those to a robot that also uses van der Waals force to climb vertical surfaces. The secret to StickyBot is in the uh, adhesive pads that are on its toes. Kutkowski's team fabricated pads that have hundreds of nanoscale stalks. As with the gecko, the stalks are sharply angled so the toes stick when going in one direction, but easily peel off when pulled the other way. When you load it with gravity, the way the robot loads it, it sticks. And to make it detach, you just have to pull it a little bit in the opposite direction and it pops right off. Now imagine troops of real Terminators climbing up the side of a building, spying on the enemy, and waiting for that moment to attack. Once a robot climbs up there, it can hang. It doesn't have to expend any power, so it can cling there for hours or even days, unobtrusively. That's quite different from something like a small helicopter, which always has to expend a lot of power and make a lot of noise. What's even more scary is not what these robots can do physically, but what they will be able to do mentally. Trusting robots with lethal decision-making will require a leap in technology. For now, the military is focused on making human soldiers stronger, like a kind of cyborg. They would be deadly, but unlike Terminators in the iconic films, wouldn't decide mankind's fate in a nanosecond. When I first saw the uh, original Terminator movie in, uh, back in 1984, I was completely taken with it, as I think most people were. I'm Michael Ferris, a screenwriter on Terminator 3 and 4. Just the whole idea of an uh, uh, unstoppable killing machine is so uh, uh, riveting. I think the, uh, the Terminator movies have really spoken to uh, an innate fear that we have of technology run amok in general. 
DARPA has recruited scientists at the robotics firm Berkeley Bionics to re-engineer the foot soldier and give it superhuman strength. The revolutionary result is the Hulk, a robotic exoskeleton for the human body. The Hulk, or Human Universal Load Carrier, is what it stands for. It's essentially a wearable robot. It takes a load from a person that would be carried in a backpack or in a vest, and it brings that load down to the ground through the exoskeleton structure and to the exoskeleton feet without going through the person. The exoskeleton can help a soldier carry more and new equipment into the field. So things that they haven't been able to do in the past, like for instance, a single soldier mortar team, a single soldier machine gun crew. These weapons now are carried by multiple soldiers. They could essentially be carried by a single soldier with a device like this. Since the wearer barely feels the load, he doesn't burn a lot of energy, so he can hike great distances with minimal effort. Here he's carrying 100 pounds and barely breaking a sweat. Sometimes it's considered a force multiplier in a sense, because exoskeletons can make each soldier be able to carry more and carry it further, so you could actually fight the same conflict with less soldiers, potentially, if you had the devices. An onboard microcomputer enables the exoskeleton to mirror the wearer's movements. Just how the Hulk senses a person's intended movements is secret. But lead mechanical designer Russ Angold can reveal where the Hulk gets his muscle. The Hulk has a computer system on board. This is the GUI right here. Um, I can feed it some information about how much I weigh, the payload I'm carrying. And through that, I put those inputs in. The machine has sensors in the feet that sense what I'm doing, and then there's sensors throughout the machine. So when I do moves, it reacts to those moves. So I don't have to do any other inputs once I've put in those initial settings. So it's a totally reactive control scheme. So whatever I do, it reacts instantly to that move. I just do what I want to do, and the XO reacts. The Mary tests show we can reduce oxygen consumption up to 15%. The more we can reduce oxygen consumption while wearing the device, the less tired the user's going to get, the farther they'll be able to go, and the fresher they'll be when they get to where they're going. The plan is that they should be able to, for example, pick up 200-pound weights hundreds of times and not even be able to notice it. They would be able to march all day and yet exercise uh, very little of their, their own muscle power to do it. Another project funded by DARPA builds on that technology and takes it to the next level. A robot with a skeletal structure of a human, only with bones made of titanium and steel. This robotic exoskeleton works by monitoring the movements of the person who's wearing it. Force sensors read the onset of movement, and these readings are fed into a computer several thousand times a second. Before the pilot exerts any significant force, the computer calculates what each hydraulic muscle needs to do. Then it commands the muscles to mirror the pilot's movements. If I were wearing this, I would only just have to start to, uh, to move my arm, and it would be uh, interpreting which muscles in its robotic skeleton it should be flexing and how hard it should be flexing them. This is actual footage of the Sarkos exoskeleton in action. The suit will enable a soldier to hike for days without tiring, operate weapons too heavy or powerful for one person, and repeatedly heft staggering amounts of weight while unloading supplies. If you could combine a brain-machine interface with um, a robotic exoskeleton, you could go some way to creating a super soldier, better than us, stronger, faster, absolutely lethal. Now, when we were researching uh, the scripts for uh, Terminator 3 and the fourth Terminator movie, we, we spent some time with uh, DARPA researchers, and it was fascinating to find out that no matter how far-fetched the stuff we were thinking about was, it was, in fact, something that they were already working on in some capacity or another. I mean, everything from weaponized insects to uh, brain implants that would control uh, military hardware. But the ultimate goal of scientists is full autonomy robots that make decisions on their own. 
and it may not be far off. Consider that manned heavier-than-air flight was once considered impossible. Then came the Wright brothers. Less than 70 years later, we were on the moon. We call this the alpha barrier, that moment when one innovation radically speeds up the tech revolution. I think you can see the robotic revolution as really kind of an extension of, well, the industrial revolution, but also the information revolution and the automation revolution. It shows the kind of tension that we have in our society and that we love what technology can do for us, but we are also suspicious about the ways that it could turn around and hurt us, in which it could be used against us. The terrifying reality of fully autonomous robots is closer than we think. Until scientists can create free-thinking robots, robots with brains, these mechanized warriors will remain under our control. But the day of independent killing machines may be approaching. From Gopper's point of view, the development of artificial intelligence is a key enabling factor in robotics. In warfare, humans rely on brain power to survive. The line between life and death depends on how fast we identify the enemy, how quickly we size up the situation, how rapidly we react. If future wars are to be fought by machines, they too will have to make split-second judgments and lightning-fast decisions all on their own. It's impractical to have remote controlled armies. You would be at a disadvantage given the fast moving pace of battle. In modern combat, uh, the situation changes every second and an autonomous robot would be able to respond instantly to those changes. And as you add autonomy to military robots, as they get used in combat operations, the question arises, at what point do we give the ability to make a kill decision to a machine? It's a question we may have to answer sooner rather than later. There was a study prepared by the U.S. Joint Forces Command which suggested that uh, as soon as 2025 we might have the technology to build autonomous battlefield robots. The barriers to spawning autonomous terminators are quickly disintegrating. We may not be far off from developing the technology for an autonomous robot uh, deciding whether to kill or not to kill. It's very difficult in the field of robotics to know exactly how advanced we are because of course uh, the technology is highly classified. But advances in some Japanese non-military droids give us a glimpse into how robots are quickly acquiring the brain power needed for autonomous combat. The Japanese computer firm Fujitsu has developed a series of robots called Hope, which are able to learn movements the same way humans do. Hope is a tool for assisting researchers in studying artificial intelligence and software for future robots. Hope's control system is run by a neural network. Fujitsu's Hope robot uh, is one that is controlled by what's called a dynamically reconfigurable neural network. Basically what this means is that they're using computers to simulate the kinds of activity that go on inside our brain. When humans learn, their brain cells make connections, organizing themselves into neural networks, which are like circuit boards. Each neural network performs a specific function or holds a specific memory. In a similar way, the Hope Robot's computer has artificial neurons, which self-organize into neural networks. This ability allows the robot to learn as a human baby would. Human babies take years, many, many years, to learn how to use their legs, how to use their hands, how to interact with other humans. Um, it's all based on learning. So a, a, a huge section of artificial intelligence is the field of learning. In experiments conducted by Swiss scientist Sylvain Callano, 
a Hope robot is seen learning a variety of physical activities from human teachers. I can learn to do a lot of things. It you know, watches how, uh, for example, researchers will execute certain kinds of jobs, how they will pick things up, how they will open a door, how they may be uh, stirring a spoon inside a bowl. And then the robot starts to mimic those kinds of activities. The scientists can then make small adjustments to the, uh, the robot's limbs to try to fine-tune those movements. And through repetition, the robot gradually learns how to do certain kinds of activities in much the same way people would. Are you happy with this? Oh, yes. As artificial neural networks become more sophisticated, they will empower robots to do more and more things on their own. The human will no longer have to tell the robot very explicitly, um, in very, very small baby steps, how to perform a task. We would only teach or educate the robot. Humans won't need to program it anymore. But in war, it's not just what you have learned, but your intuition. If, for example, the robot is in a situation where the tension is escalating, would it be able to pick up on the subtle clues like a human soldier would? For robots to be autonomous, they need to have a lot of real-world smarts built into them. In many cases, they need to also be able to understand that people have intentions, that they have plans, that they are doing things. So there are situations in which they may need to try to get inside the head of a human being and understand what's going on. Turns out they're working on that too. What's really amazing is that these days you now actually have robots that are starting to be programmed to understand that what people want may not really be always what they're expressing. That in fact people may be thinking one thing and actually acting another way. One of the more uncanny examples of these socially intelligent robots is Robasuke, born in the Kobayashi lab at Japan's Waseda University. <laughs> Robosuke converses naturally with humans using both verbal and non-verbal communication. The robot needs several levels of technology to have a conversation with us. My name is Fuji. I'm an associate professor at Waseda University. I invented a conversation robot, Robosuke. One of the basic level functions, as you can see on screen, is that the robot detects a human and recognizes whom it's talking to. We call the function personal recognition. Even more remarkable, the robot can recognize head gestures to interpret the attitude of the person it's talking to. Whenever human beings are communicating, no matter what they're saying, there's also an undercurrent of emotion and it's also being expressed, whether we realize it or not. Robosuke interprets a nod as a positive attitude and a tilt or shake of the head as negative attitude. More amazing still, the robot can also read a person's state of mind by their tone of voice. The Robisuke robot is programmed to be able to listen to tones of voice that people are using and to be able to interpret those in such a way to know whether or not there's some kind of deception of whether or not they are saying one thing but really want something else. Bye bye. Bye bye. Robisuke is a tool for non military research, but such human like powers of perception would be useful in military robots. They would be able to read potentially hostile body language or someone who is lying and react. And the possibilities could veer even further into the realm of the fantastic. What we won't know is the extent uh, to which a robot, when it becomes sufficiently sophisticated and autonomous, actually crosses the line and becomes self-aware and alive. Mankind is rapidly developing robots that can make the decision to apply lethal force. And when that moment comes, when robots can decide who and when to kill, it will bring about a power shift in which autonomous terminators will be fighting our wars.
They'll never make ethical decisions. They'll make a sh their share of mistakes, whether based upon faulty data sets or, um, or bad programming. And they'll kill by mistake sometimes, and, or they'll kill the wrong person. And unlike a human being, they'll never regret it. Which raises the question, what happens when robots become smarter than us? If it's true, as some scientists are saying, that uh, they may develop robots as smart as humans by uh, uh, 2040 and, and even smarter thereafter, it seems almost inevitable that the military is going to want to uh, co-opt them for their own use. Um, that's, uh, that's what the military does. It really is intelligence that enables you to win in a conflict like warfare. The only thing that can defend you from a artificial intelligence that has it in for you is to have artificial intelligence that's even smarter, that's on your side. The first organization to use robotic soldiers may well end up being the last. If robots are smarter than us, stronger, uh, quicker, uh, then what if in that great science fiction nightmare they really do decide that uh, uh, they deserve uh, to be ruling the world and not us. Autonomous robots rising up is only one fear. Another concern is that these same killer droids will be able to reproduce. As impossible as it seems, it's already happening. At the Fanuc robot factory in Japan, the robots are now actually building other robots. Um, some people would see that as a kind of scary prospect, but I think the important thing is that these days they're at least still building robots for us and not for themselves. But robot reproduction is moving far beyond the assembly line and into the realm of the incredible. To create self-replicating droids, scientists are investigating the idea of making robots out of thousands of identical nanoscale robots. If you go out, say, 25 years, or so, you could have a nanobot, a blood cell size device. It's not biological, but it could actually self-replicate just the way biological systems do, gather materials in the wild and, and assemble a copy of itself. And that could be very destructive because it could then multiply the same way disease elements do. These micro-machines would be the equivalent of the biomolecules that are building blocks of all living creatures. In the same way that our bodies are made up of different organs that are in turn made up of different cells and those are made up of smaller subcellular units, there are ideas that maybe we could someday have robots that assemble themselves out of lots of different specialized components. We are very quickly moving into a world where the capacity for sophisticated machines to make duplicates of themselves, that's probably within a generation and that will more fundamentally reshape society and how we relate to each other than nearly any development in the past century. Being able to regenerate your troops in the, uh, in the midst of battle is obviously an appealing notion, but it also seems like a scenario that has a, a lot of potential for uh, running amok, a la the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Self-replicating robots, particularly if they're armed, do perhaps represent a, a threat which ultimately uh, speaking could lead to the end of the human race. Robots with superhuman strength, speed, intelligence, and the ability to think and kill on their own. Once real Terminators charge onto the battlefield, the consequences of that revolution are impossible to predict. The gradual encroachment, high-tech weaponry that distances us from the realities of warfare could theoretically eventually take the planet to a scenario that's not unlike that in the, uh, in the Terminator films.